So the last and final presentation of the submitted papers to the ISORD 14 conference is from uh, Julian Booker of uh, Bristol University. Um, and he's going to be presenting robust design process for dimensional and geometric features in cold formed components. Laser. It's the, that button there. Okay. You got it the wrong way up, by the way. The other end is the mouth end. Okay. Um. How do I kick this off? Oh, it is off. Okay, sorry. Uh, the more observant of you will notice there's been a title change for this, uh, from the programme. On review of the paper, um, it was pointed out that maybe we didn't have a robust design process, just a problem. And um, what I'll try and do is lead you through the process, um, alluding to some sort of solution um, in this particular example. I'm... Um, I work out the Solid Mechanics Research Group in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Bristol, but I'm originally a design engineer, uh, working heavily in design methods, but we, we don't have a design group as such at, at Bristol anymore, even though we've got four professors. Uh, it's a bit strange. Um, <clears throat> we may get enough critical mass to form one in the future. Um, my, my colleagues there, the, the PhD student is John, John Paul Woodhead, who uh, he was... Uh, um, wasn't going to come to this because I knew it was in Copenhagen and I wanted to come to Copenhagen and as a professor Chris Truman uh, who's a professor and head of group of solar mechanics. Uh, so this, uh, the research background, it's a, a three and a half year project uh, working with a leading bearing manufacturer who actually is not far from here, you may guess <laughs> who it is, uh, but they have a satellite company in, uh, in the UK, not far from Bristol, it's about half an hour drive, uh, which is, is great for the PhD student because uh, he's been embedded within the company for the last two and a half years, working very closely with their process and design engineers. Um, originally, the intent was to map the whole design and manufacturing process used to create these, these products, and the, the products is a self-lubricating planes focal bearing, which many of you may be familiar with in terms of application, but may not be familiar with in terms of how they're made and I'll go through that process. Um, the other thing, I'll come to the reasons why, that we, from a, a mechanical point of view, it'd be uh, interesting to characterize all the material properties that went into these bearings. And there's many different types of bearing materials and uh, sizes ranging from 10 millimeters up to 150 millimeters diameter, um, and different uh, classification uh, of products and types of products. Um, we'd want to simulate the manufacturing process using validated models, and currently there aren't any, and I'll come on to that later. For, for this, on the face of it, it looks a very simple process of moving metal around. Um, and what we'd like to do is ultimately, and this will culminate possibly next summer, late next year, is to present a series of design tools, um, I'll go into that more later, for new bearing introduction, because currently they, they don't have much at all. So these are the elements of the, the planes focal bearing, so you recognise this, you may have used it, you may have specified it in your design. Um, so currently you can see um, the outside shell here, there's an inner ball, and in between here is a liner, which is uh, very sensitive to, the, to the, that company. Uh, they don't like to release too much information, that's where they uh, very much compete uh, with their competitors in terms of this self-lubricating composite liner. Um, so the applications, you can see many uh, varied, wide application base. Uh, automotive, uh, rail, used a lot in aerospace and helicopters as well, and uh, even food processing industry. Uh, they all they look different, but they, they maintain some element uh, form uh, with the spherical nature of the bearing. Uh, so init initially you have a, uh, a blank outside and you have a rigid ball inside. The liner is embedded in there, you can just see it there. And this is a very simple schematic of a, a lower die, uh, outer race, inner race, liner, and a, 
upper die comes down and uh, you get compression. Actually, it's quite a complex uh, movement of metal from elastic to plastic. Uh, you get a bit of uh, compression in there at the end. You also get a bit of uh, quite a lot of bending and uh, maybe what we traditionally call swaging. And in fact, the company call it swaging. It's actually called nosing or tube end forming, believe it or not. And uh, here we have the pictures of the, the dies. And you can see the evolution of the stresses as the dies come down. And you can also note that the stress, sort of neutral axis down here, the stress deviates because of the complex nature of the stresses. And analytical formulations at the moment don't exist for this thickness of tube being formed. They do exist for thin tubes because what, you're, what you can do is neglect the through stresses. You can say they're approximately zero. This is alluding to a, a thick cylinder, not Lame's thick cylinder. And um, this is where it gets complicated. So there are no analytical solutions to this problem. We have to use finite element analysis. And unfortunately, from that point of view, it's quite a complex process of material movement uh, because it's also done dynamically. So there are strain rate dependencies there, uh, which you have to model. And we have, we've had to measure those, as well as friction and friction uh, is related to pressure. And obviously, as you can see from the movement of the dies related to each other, to the material that on the blank outside, the pressure will change through that cycle. Uh, so it is nonlinear, as is uh, the material properties, through the evolution from, from zero stroke to final stroke. Um, so at the moment, the... Uh, and this really bucks the trend in companies in the UK. Um, production is dominated by past experience. Uh, there's limited design for production data, but there's also little learned or passed on, lessons learned, um, which is unfortunate. Trial and error process settings, and this is partly their admission as well. And we've done a full appraisal of the process that they go through in order to develop new products. Uh, many test batches, and typically for first... Uh, sort of series of batches, they may get 30 to 50 percent loss, um, and they, they just expect this. And and uh, one of the the head guys at that company, which we can't name, in the UK, it was one of my old master students, and he uh, he remembered his uh, design for quality lectures from, from myself, and he said, "Would you like to do a project? A bit of nepotism there, but we got a pro this project." And he said, "Let's try and solve this problem." Um, so we understand from an initial observation of the process that manufacturing variations have a great impact on geometric conformity. Essentially, the sphere needs to be maintained, specification requirement in terms of dimensional uh, constraints, but also because it has a high impact on what, what the bearing, what the customer sees as a performance factor, which is the uh, frictional moment, which this bearing must possess within certain tolerances. <clears throat> so we, we do desire robust tolerances uh, for things like waste, produ uh, waste production, cost effectiveness, performance uh, and compatibility. So that's the objective. Um, through a thorough analysis of all the, the failures, um, talking to process ops, engineers, designers, uh, there are uh, nine different failure modes associated with this, this very simple product. You can have things like tipping, sat satinization, where you get over compression, um, ball crushing, sounds, sounds a bit odd, all these things. Necking, sounds like some weird sexual uh, acts. Uh, liner slippage, offset. Um, and uh, a lot of them are associated with, uh, potentially with geometric uh, nonconformities. Um, some are just process errors, process setup errors. Maybe um, uh, other errors are creeping in there. But there was uh, a high indication that there were variation related. And we did some sort of process failure modes and effects analysis, not exactly the same sort of ratings. And liner slippage and offset and tipping came out quite important in terms of the impact um, as a failure mode. Um, and again, through some, through some uh, discussions with, um, and looking at the literature, we, we devised some sort of uh, um, array of potential variables which input to the problem and things that we could... Uh, tangibly sort of uh, measure as well as an output or predict. Um, 
and I'm not going to go through all of those, but things like you know, strain rate is there, friction, lubrication, um, geometric conformity, and things like this. So the methodology, and being versed in the dark arts of design process, I try to, uh, try, try to adopt and uh, uh, present a methodology to this is, well, we, we can predict, we haven't got a, we're developing a validated uh, finite element model for this, is how we, as we stochastically uh, um, characterize the properties, friction materials, and, and even geometric, uh, but it would be nice to look at, trace through, bearing manufacturers, individual components through the whole process. Now, there are 100 different processes involved, so 50 one side and 50 the other, of just the nosing operation. So there's a lot of inputs to that, to the thing I'm just showing you here, and then there's quite a few out after as well. Uh, but we can only look at the, the thing which I can deal with, uh, really, which is, is the nosing process. Uh, but we were going to measure the geometric uh, relationships between the chamfers and the outside diameter, the balls, uh, the inner diameter of the ball, and to see which were not process capable, which were process capable, record these, look at the forming load and the frictional moment for each individual bearing and try and trace that through, <coughs> and try and analyse this data as best we could and calculate some, uh, or recommend some... Uh, um, provide some recommendations for process performance. But uh, our initial uh, assumptions were um, sort of uh, proved where we, we focused on the, the issue of just the chamfers. Now, there are no analytical equations which, which you can use for this. So obviously, fine details like this have to be done by finite element analysis. But you can appreciate that there is something going on there with the, in the interaction between the die and the component blank chamfers. Um, now, there is a geometric concentricity relationship to do with the outside of the blank and the inside of the blank. The ball, as it happens, and the ball diameter, the spherical nature of its diameter is, is very highly, highly process capable. The outside of the blank um, and the inside of the blank is, is pretty good as well. Um, the chamfers are, is where the problem actually uh, lay. The, uh, the concentricity of the chamfers, the mating of the die with the chamfer on one end and the other end um, turned out to be the problem. And you can see that the extreme limits of the chamfers as they set at the moment, uh, visually, schematically, is shown here. So you can, uh, you can get a, a fair idea of the tolerances they allocate at the moment and what physically it means in terms of just one side of the blank and the chamfer that it has. Um, from some initial FEA, FEA we, we looked at the sensitivity of the forming load uh, variation, which is a tangible output of the process with uh, the chamfer interaction between angle and length, for example, and found uh, it's not overly conclusive, um, the relationship between, between those, although there's a steeper gradient where you get in uh, sort of minimum, minimum angle and uh, a change in its length. Um, but what we decided to do was measure a number of these blanks. And this is their drawing, not ours. I can see an error on this already. So I'm not going to own up to that one. Maybe I'll see that one there. I'm not supposed to chamfer like that. Uh, dimension chamfers. Uh, but what we did is use an optical comparator to measure the chamfers on one side and the other. And then try, try and relate these statistically into the model. Uh, this is the optical comparator uh, machine. You can just see there an outline of... Uh, chamfer on the inside and the outside. Uh, we're dealing with very, very small deviations, micron level deviations. Initially, we looked at the volume. Um, these limits here are notional because not all dimensions do have a tolerance, but you can see there's quite wide variation. And we're highlighting throughout the next few slides very quickly sample 2 and sample 14. Sample 2 had quite a low volume, and quite, sample four, 14 had quite a high volume. And uh, the bigger the volume, the more energy you need to, to, to form, um, as we know from s simple sort of mechanics. Uh, also, looking at the chamfer concentricity, eccentricity, you can see from one side to another, again, these limits, they don't ha actually have a geometrical tolerance requirement on the chamfers, but we've taken the one for the diameter, geometrical concentricity. You can see some uh, uh, are displaced, so relative to each other. Uh, again, highlighting samples 2 and 14, which we'll come on to later. In terms of the shift from one side to the other, you have to be what's called use a folded normal distribution. So you can accumulate, if one chamfer's over here, uh, on one side and one's over here, you can look at probably 
probability density function which describes the relationship between the two uh, being displaced, which is quite an important parameter for our studies. Um, and there's quite a lot of falling out. And these are the other measurements we took. So you can see these more in detail in the paper. Fairly well behaved there for that property, which is chamfer, constant shift. But together, this folded normal distribution, the accumulation from one side to the other, potentially you get quite a lot of fallout here. And there's quite a long tail. So we've got a problem of they can make the blank diameters concentric, so inside, outside, but when they take it out of the machine, their machine and the chamfers, and there is offset from the tooling, and their processors just aren't capable. Um, other things here, we've got chamfer angle and chamfer length, and I think there's some others in the um, in the paper. So this this is. Um, this is our sort of understanding at the moment. This is the forming load for this particular bearing size. And we have, for 10 different bearing sizes, experimental data. And each one of these lines at the moment is described by uh, 40 samples. So you can see it's quite well behaved until we get to the end where we get some compression. Also, there's something not happening here where the finite element model is not predicting this early sort of um, interaction between the chamfers. It may also be to be do uh, with something to do with the non-linearity of friction because we we're only doing the measurements for that at the moment and that's quite a, a, a long process in, in order to collect that data stochastically uh, but in the middle we're matching it quite well but these two samples again are highlighted where we've got sample 14 uh, which had high geometrical eccentricity with the chamfers uh, and two which was very good so that was uh, very close to zero so mean Shift was very good. I also had a quite a, a, a low volume. Uh, but there's certainly something different between these two points, 10% uh, different in, in, in forming load. And then <clears throat> the, the, the idea that we can uh, trace these two, or all of the components, to the, the, what the customer sees is in terms of frictional moment was made. And again, you can see uh, 14 and 2. 14 is consistently high in terms of frictional moment, and 2 was consistently low. And initially, this process, uh, straight from the press, um, uh, pr provides quite a, a large uh, uh, variation, whereas after the post-washing and drying, and even a little bit of uh, deep rolling to try and get these bearings freed up, we get this nice tight distribution. But even a, a low uh, sort of encroaching on the lower limit is bad, apparently, because we still need some physical frictional moment. So the conclusions, analytical approaches are uh, not really viable uh, for assessing the, the impact of feature variation in these sort of components. Uh, large sample sizes, empirical studies are needed, FE, stochastic data, um, extremes in chamfer eccentricity in particular have a, have a, a massive impact on the in, in process failure modes, but we're only just getting our head around the idea of what links to what. There's nine different failure modes, there's 10 or 12 different parameters which we're all stochastically uh, measuring, and um, it's, it's very much a work in progress. Um, but we are recommending to the industrial collaborator at this stage to make sure they get geometric uh, tolerances on their chamfers as well as their, their normal dimensional uh, features. Uh, change in machining operation uh, process is, is suggested. Um, and also make sure that the uh, process capability levels are good. So we're going to do more process capability studies. Uh, we're at the moment, experimentally modeling the friction to look at its nonlinear effects, because it certainly has some from the calibrating the FE model. Um, developed full stochastic FE models, and I'm, I've noted that Lightning Hypercube has been mentioned, so to rationalize the number of FE models, uh, we're going to use Lightning Hypercube and present the company with a MATLAB program which populates all the parameters so they can essentially do a deterministic model, run it 30, 50 times. And that is something that they want, uh, as well as simple Excel spreadsheet as well. Create sensitivity measures. And then we're doing a sideline, as, as, as you would appreciate, in solid mechanics, which is looking at the stress internally in large bearings. So we've got a program, uh, Poldy, one of the uh, neutron uh, diffraction testing facilities, to look at the stresses in ideally formed and then overformed bearings. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, a very hardened engineering production case there. <laughs> or hard nosed, should I say. Yep. Um, any questions? Tobias? Uh, it's really interesting, and especially because the DE, our retrospect is one of the most important things in quality management in the company itself. Uh, but now that you were focusing a lot on the DOE, how was it integrated in the quality management?
management approach of the company itself, or was it just something you did at the university specifically addressing this this, um, or this, this part? We, um, as I said, we've got the PhD student embedded within the company one or two days a week. We have a very good relationship with them. We can get any data we want. They will provide us new test equipment, samples, and they're very much engaged in that process. And we've only just started the discussions about what tools and techniques uh, are needed in terms of our legacy of uh, implementation of these methods from when we leave. But it just so happens they've asked the PhD student to be a, an engineer there after he finishes, so that, that will be good. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, from, the, the, from the days when I used to work in design methods, I've recommended a number of different levels of implementation, so simple guidelines, simple Excel spreadsheet, maybe based on things like the Holloman's equation or slab method for working out forming loads, and then the Latin Hypercube system, uh, which is quite complex. They're going to buy in Abacus, for example, and run their own FE models, um, because the Latin Hypercube is, is fully interactive for their own data. All the data that we've measured is in there. They can put their own data in as well, so they can get out a number of systems which can then allude to some statistical output in terms of forming load or frictional moment. Um, so it's, this, it's a little bit by bit stage and very much engage with them, see what they want, but from my experience, when I cut my teeth on design methods a number of years ago, I think I know what's, what's needed and they, they haven't disagreed yet. Um, to get it used, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the, the issue, but hopefully John Paul can, uh, when he's employed there as well, can make sure that these are continuously used effectively uh, on, on new product introductions especially. So, so it's starting for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them in there, the profits, uh, you know, go into the company and hopefully things change. Yeah. So, any other questions? May I ask one? Uh, the, the chamfer feature, mm. is that purely an assembly feature? Uh, it's for the it's a process feature, yeah. so we get engagement of the dies. Um, just so happens that that feature disappears after nosing, so we can't look at it afterwards. Okay. Yeah. And then it's actually machined away because we need to get back to a cylinder, so it's mounted in a bearing housing. So it's purely there as part of the process guide, but they they seem to have lost this uh, idea that you know chamfers guide, and if they're eccentric, then you're <laughs> and you get one on the other side, then you're going to get a number of these failure modes. So um, they, 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 they haven't said they're going to implement any change yet, and yeah. we're still only about 75% of the way through the project. But I think what I would like to do is, is get another batch done to a more robust geometrical concentricity and, and put that through the production process and trace it through in a similar way. Um, yeah. We may not have time to do that, but we, we may have enough confidence in our finite element models in order to say it would be good enough. So. And, and the fact that it's it's not a functional service during the operation of the bearing, but only during the yeah. the assembly gives you opportunity to do some uh, yeah. optimization on it. It does, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah basically, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and I know it's uh, Julian's anniversary today, so I really hope your wife doesn't end up with this. Uh, <laughs> no. But, but thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. Yeah.